Hey, fellow humans, this is Robert Roach, one of the hosts of the Type 1 Planet podcast, where we're dedicated to creating a new model of our civilization in which human beings can survive and thrive for thousands of years into the future. One of the core tenets of our mission is finding ways to preserve human knowledge through any event, no matter how catastrophic or long-term. Our culture is built on the cumulative knowledge of humanity. Losing our knowledge and our understanding of the past is the pathway to history repeating itself. And that knowledge of humanity is all that will outlive us. We must find ways for it to survive. Today, I had the honor of interviewing Nova Spivak. He's an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, an author. He's the founder and CEO of the early stage science and technology incubator, Magical. And he's the co-founder of the ARC Mission Foundation, an organization dedicated to depositing planetary information backups around our planet and our solar system that are designed to last for billions of years. They have incredible novel technology for preserving information, including putting it into quartz crystals and as code and DNA molecules embedded in glass beads. People like Nova, they exist in the present, yet every second of their lives is dedicated to creating a stronger and more robust future for all of humanity. They embody the mission of Type 1 Planet, and I invite you to become as inspired and excited as I was during this interview. This is the Type 1 Planet podcast. Please watch or listen on your podcasting app or on YouTube, and uh, go to our social media, engage with us, send us questions, and visit us at type1planet.net. All right. Hello and welcome to the Type 1 Planet podcast. I'm Robert Roach. I'm joined by our guest, Nova Spivak, an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, an author. He's the founder and CEO of the Early Stage Science and Technology Incubator, Magical, and co-founder of the Arch Mission Foundation, which we're going to go into today. It's an organization dedicated to depositing planetary information backups around our planet and our solar system that are designed to last for a billion years. So for that vision alone. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you, Nova, and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So the mission of Type 1 Planet is to reimagine our civilization so we can enter into a long-term sustainable state that's in equilibrium with ourselves and our planetary environment. And there's so many topics I want to dive in with you. So we'll need to keep a limited and deep scope on the Arch Mission Foundation, but I think we could have an entirely separate episode about Magical and what you're doing over there. So I'd be excited to do that as well. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to ask what the Arch Mission Foundation is through a quote from a book that you've actually already launched into space, and I'll let you explain that. And the book is uh, Isaac Asimov's The Foundation. And the quotation is, any fool can tell a crisis when it arrives. The real service to the state is to detect it in embryo. So my question for you is, what crisis have you detected in embryo that's being addressed by your life's work? Okay, well, uh, let's start a couple things here. So first of all, um, we pronounce it ARC mission as in oh, archive, shit. even though it's spelled arch and we actually both are fine actually. Um, but it, either pronunciation is totally fine, but just so a little note, we call it arc as in archive. Um, and the, the reason we started this is because we can guarantee with certainty with a hundred percent certainty that, uh, civilization ending events will occur in the future because they have occurred in the past and we can see from the geological record um, that they occur with regularity and we can also see if you look at the solar system and you know the position of uh large uh meteors and comets and so forth uh, you know there's a probability that within a certain period of time one of those is going to hit the planet uh, so if nothing else uh large impacts do occur with regularity but we also know uh, that there's events generated by the planet itself, like volcanism, earthquakes, uh, massive climate change. And then we have risks from outside of our solar system, for example, gamma ray bursts, uh, for instance, which uh, can kill off life and so on. So there are, there are really a number of different existential risks, uh, but they are on pretty long time scales, you know, on the, on the level of millions of years. Um, but we're actually overdue for one. If the records are accurate, we're overdue. We're really at the point now where you know, one of them should occur pretty soon. Uh, soon meaning you know within hundreds of thousands to millions of years. But that's that's really a blink of an eye on planetary scale. Now um, there are then 
a whole new category of risks generated by people. Um, and those are, you know, risks of self-destruction primarily, either through war or through environmental destruction or you know, messing with our genome to the point where something goes seriously wrong. So, you know, with these added risks, uh, which operate on a much shorter time scale, uh, you know, we, we have a pretty critical period of time, which if, if we survive it, um, say the next 100 to 200 years, then we'll probably survive long enough to get to the next planetary cataclysm. Um, but actually, the next 100 to 200 years are a pretty critical time uh, where, you know, the, the civilizations of the planet are very immature and, and uh, tribal and warlike. Uh, we have technologies where, you know, one idiot can accidentally trigger uh, a global uh, nuclear war. So, you know, it's a very high risk period of time. And so we know these are these risks exist uh, and we know that sooner or later, one of these things is going to occur. And where does the ARC Mission Foundation come into this conversation? Uh, what, why is knowledge, for example, so important in this discussion? So our goal is to try to take a long view and at least try to help whatever civilization is present at the time of one of these cataclysms and anyone who comes after or survives it, or or re-evolves and comes after. Uh, we're trying to help them recover more quickly and hopefully avoid making the same mistakes. So in order to do that, uh, we want to provide them with the records of everything we knew. Not only our knowledge, not not just scientific and technical knowledge, which is pretty pretty easy to reproduce, frankly, but also our cultural knowledge, our history our art, our literature, our music, the other achievements that we made, those are those are things which won't be regenerated. They're unique. Uh, but more importantly, the lessons, um, the things that we learned, our mistakes and our successes, can we can we hand that down so that whoever is there can rebuild faster um, or in the long term, they can learn from our mistakes and hopefully avoid making them again. Because my hypothesis is this may have already occurred on Earth a few times. We might not be the first advanced civilization on this planet. There is evidence, although it's it's not conclusive, but there is some evidence that there may have been some advanced civilizations millions of years ago. We found some strange relics that can't really be explained, and but had to have been machined or built by, by a, a semi-advanced civilization. So if that's the case, maybe this has occurred before, but it was so long ago we've lost all the records of it. In any case, um, if we're the first, it may occur again. And so we want to make sure that we can provide some continuity because I think part of the, the mark of an advanced civilization is that it can survive these kinds of recurring events. Now, of course, another way to survive these events is to become multiplanetary. That's another way to back up our species, if you will, by being redundant on different planets. That will happen, I believe, but even then, we still will need to um, transfer the knowledge from planet to planet and to bring it with us as we start to spread out through space because the distances are quite large. Uh, and sometimes it's possible that a colony may form on one planet and the origin colony gets wiped out and then they're there uh, on their own. So they still need all the knowledge. And all it takes is one generation to be far enough removed where you forget everything <laughs> Right. And that's not happening right here on Earth. Yeah. Interesting. Um, now, I do want to get into the nitty gritty about your projects and the criteria for selecting knowledge and all that stuff. Uh, but this, the concept here is so fascinating. And um, it's something that I, I, one of our first interviews was with Lewis Dartnell, who wrote The Knowledge, which is uh, yep. the, yeah, well, one of the contributors, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was an interesting part of our conversation where we delved into the uh, the difference between functional you func a functional project like the like that book and art and how you know yes this book is a functional uh, tool that can be utilized to learn and to do things but also it's a piece of inspirational artwork that shows you the fragility of our civilization and, and inspires you to have longer term thinking and inspires you to 
uh, work in such a way where you want to preserve and want to uh, invest in future generations. How much of this project is artwork and inspirational uh, thinking in your mind? That's a good question. I, I think that from the perspective of people who are alive today, it is 100% artwork because um, it doesn't really benefit them in the same way that it will benefit recipients in the, in the distant future. Uh, so for people who contribute, people who participate, or people who simply witness what we're doing, it is a kind of performance in that it's, it's showing that we're doing this and what and it's showing what's valuable and what we think is important to hand down. Um, but the benefits, you know, other than inspirational benefits, um, are really uh, for those in the distant future after the people today are, are long gone. And so you could say it's 100% an art project today in the sense that it's, it's only benefiting people aesthetically, if you will, they believe it's important. But the, the long-term benefits are, are guaranteed as long as there's somebody there to receive them. Mm. Someone to observe. Uh, the pragmatists, I can see, I can hear all of the pragmatic arguments against these projects, you know. And... Well, but you see, it's a statistical argument that we're making. It is very pragmatic. Statistically, it's it's 100% probable, right? It's guaranteed that these events occur. They have and they will. Down so to the earth being absorbed by the sun. It's going to happen. Well, eventually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things get destroyed. It just happens. And we know that. We kind of know approximately when they'll happen. So there's no question about that. That's just an objective fact. Um, so knowing that, putting preparations in place is a perfectly rational, logical thing to do. Um, it's just like buying insurance. You you hope that you won't need it. But if you don't have it when you do need it, then you're kind of up the creek. Uh, so here, you know, this is very much just a planetary insurance policy. Um, that's just privately funded at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, but it is just a planetary insurance policy to back up critical uh, information, knowledge, and even genomic data uh, to back it up and and preserve it and hand it down in a way where it won't be destroyed over a deep time. And that's a perfectly rational thing to do if you believe that the statistics are accurate, you know, the regularity of, of uh, cataclysms on Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, let's dive into this technology you're creating a lot of novel technology and it's it it they're they're inventions that i could see being essential for a space a future space bearing civilization so uh let's dive into it let's start with what the arc library is functionally what does it look like what is it made of uh and you i know that you've done m multiple missions with uh with multiple versions of this technology. So I'll let you start where you think would be most appropriate for someone who knows nothing about it. Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, we, we spent a lot of time researching what storage media uh, to use for long-term storage. And if you look at the past and the records we have of the, of the past, what has actually survived are really three things, stone, metal, and DNA. That's what we have from the past. Uh, and so, and when you think about trying to preserve something over long periods of time, um, stone, metal, and DNA are good candidates because it's already worked. Uh, today, uh, we're using those three technologies, uh, but we've advanced the state of the art, so uh, we can store a lot more data than before. Um, so let's take them in order, starting with stone. Um, today, um, we use quartz crystals, and we can write into quartz uh, using a femtosecond laser. Uh, it's a new technology that came out of a university in the UK. It's essentially the next generation beyond um, DVD storage. Now it's it's optical storage, but in stone, in, in crystals, um, at a very, very small scale. So uh, it's extremely dense. You can store a petabyte in a, in a disc about the size of the DVD. Um, but it's still very advanced and early stage, and the, the technology for writing exists. It's pretty slow, but it works. The technology for recovering the data is even slower at this point. So we're still about a decade or two away from having you know, commercial-grade technologies that can utilize the media. But you know, from our perspective, that's fine because we're looking at an audience in you know, a million years, um, and 
you know, they will eventually have the technology to recover what's encoded in this. The key is that it lasts for a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's digital. It doesn't decay. It's, it's very well preserved with high density. Um, so that's what we used um, for the mission with Elon Musk, where we put the Asimov Foundation trilogy into the glove compartment of his Tesla, which is now orbiting the sun for 50 million years or longer. Uh, we just don't know uh, after 50 million years, the map gets less precise about it. It'll hit anything. But we know for at least 50 million years, it'll be there. That was some um, jaw-dropping artwork right there. That was that was a fun performance. I mean, look, what he did was the greatest piece of performance art in, in history. You know, we 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 got to be a payload on that and go along for the ride. You know, we added the poetic a gesture of putting the foundation trilogy in it. Um, but you know, it was an incredible iconic moment uh, for him and for and for the planet. I mean, it's so cool, and it's the strangest thing in in the solar system today. It's, you know, that car orbiting the solar system with the guy in it. It's the strangest thing in the solar system. So hopefully it'll attract some attention in the deep future and they'll find it and they'll find the crystal inside that has the trilogy. It really reminded me of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know? Totally. Absolutely. There's a sense of humor in, in the universe if you're yeah. willing to look for it. Yeah, totally. Um, so then, oh, go ahead. And you were referring to the technology to be able to read. I can understand the ability to etch into yeah. quartz. Um, and then there's the ability to read and understand and process that. Is that the arc yeah. primer? No. Um, the, so the the primer we'll get into that. But but for the first for this first mission in in courts, um, we we really only included two things. One was the Asimov Foundation trilogy etched into the courts, and two was a decoding key um, to to understand how to decode the information. So the decoding key is encoded in a way that's um, not as hard to read, essentially, and not as dense. Um, so that's there uh, in the front of it, but the re the rest of it, um, you know, is digital data encoded in a special way. So the decoding key you can access from the surface, but when you get inside the crystal, you need special technology mm. to um, to recover. You can see it's there. It's like a little tiny silver DVD inside the quartz. You can see it inside mm -hmm. the quartz. So you know there's something there. But reading it is a challenge unless you unless you're pretty advanced, more advanced than we are today, actually. Okay, so right. That's a pretty advanced audience. Now, for a less advanced audience, um, we found a way to do this with metal, um, and there we take nickel, nickel discs, and we encode the information optically as analog images on the surface of the disc, like microfilm. So instead of using uh, standard photographic film, just imagine we're just using metal. And the images, instead of just being, uh, you know, images in film, they're actually appearing as um, surface relief uh, etchings, which basically means it's raised out of the surface. Almost like, you know, if you look at a rubber stamp, right, you can see it's raised from the surface or the surface is dug out. You can look, think of it either way. Uh, in this case, the images are etched such that they're kind of raised above the surface. So every letter is like raised a little bit above the surface. It's literally like a stamp. Uh, and so that's nickel. We use nickel. And nickel is an element. It doesn't decay. Uh, and we have a way using nanotechnology. We call it, It's called nanofiche, like microfiche, um, where uh, starting with a laser, uh, we master it to glass, and then we use an electrolytic process to basically grow the nickel on the glass atom by atom, peel it off. That's the that's sort of the first generation master. And you then you grow um, a positive. You grow a negative from that. You peel that off, and then you use that, and you grow the positive, and you peel that off, and that is your final disc. So um, these layers are thinner than paper. Um, they're very very thin. We can make them thicker, but we we like to make them very thin. And then um, we put them together into a stack, and each layer each layer has um, eight circles in which, uh, within that circle, there are one thousand eight hundred and forty four images, analog images. Each circle is twenty billion pixels. And there are eight of these per layer. Um, so at the end. Um, Let's say we did, uh, let's say five layers would be about 73,000 analog images. So we take five layers of these and 73,000 pictures 
etched into nickel. And what are the pictures of? The pictures are of uh, pages of books um, or artworks, photographs, anything you want, but they're monochrome. So if you want to, if you want to encode color information, then you would have to do a color separation. So you'd have four images for CMYK. Uh, otherwise, they're monochrome. Uh, but this is analog, meaning that you can see it with a microscope and not a very powerful microscope, a microscope that we had in the 1700s. You can see these images and, and retrieve the information just visually. So you don't need a computer. You don't need any advanced digital processing. All you need is a simple optical microscope with an objective lens. So um, that technology is, is, is good because it requires a lot less on the part of the recipient to recover the data. Well, so theoretically you could in, implant the visual instructions on how to read the quartz crystals yes, with, with, on, on, on nickel, and that's the first stage of communication across time. Yeah, actually we take it even further than that because the nickel, we have two technologies. One is the analog and one is digital. So we can also record a DVD master into nickel and that's just digital, right? A DVD master, is, it's a DVD, it's just in nickel. Oh, and wow. Digital data. Uh, interesting. So what we do is we have layers of analog and then we have layers of digital underneath. And the analog layers, as well as con everything else they contain, they also teach you everything you need to know to build a computer and all the codecs to recover the digital data. So, so this is our concept of a staircase of knowledge, okay? Uh, at the very beginning of the stack of layers is a larger images that are easier to see. And that um, starts with what we call the primer, uh, where we teach you important information that you need in order to understand what's in the layers. So the very first thing we show you is, here's the architecture of what's in here, essentially the table of contents. Here's what's in this stack. Secondly, we then provide um, millions of images of different important situations and, and uh, facts and basic knowledge with callouts into multiple languages. So for example, a scene of a kitchen, you know, this is the stove, this is the table, this is the mom, this is the dad, this is the kid, this is the refrigerator in five languages, right? So there's the picture of the situation with callouts in all these languages. So we have about a million concepts sort of defined that way so that you can have some visual uh, anchor for the words, right? So you, you know, if you just have a language and you could have a table and everything makes sense and you know the syntax of grammar, but in the end, you don't know what any of it means. You can operate it, but you don't know what it means. But here we're anchoring these concepts to something, you know, visual at least. So essentially there's some qualia attached to the concept so that at least if the recipient has eyes, they have a chance of having something to bait, to attach this concept to. Like a visual dictionary almost. It's like a visual dictionary or visual encyclopedia. And then after that, we then have from those five languages, uh, we have language resources that trans that show those languages translated into every known language, all existing past and present languages that humanity knows of. So there's over a billion and a half translations. And some of that comes from the Long Now Foundation from their projects to do language translation. I want to talk to them um, so bad. <laughs> yeah, so we have we have good stuff from them as well. And then after that, after the primer, the, after the language part of the primer, then we start teaching higher level concepts. So that's where we have encyclopedias, dictionaries, the Wikipedia references, and many, many other kind of reference works that from now that you have language and basic concepts, we can start to explain all the basic knowledge across every subject. And then, then we get into art, literature, science, and other things. So then we have books and other kinds of resources that, you know, more than 30,000 books and other resources that, you know, cover every subject, history, philosophy, religion, visual art, music, you know, every area that you'd find in a university library. So that's the, that's the sort of architecture of the stack. Then after that, there are special topic areas we call vaults, which have, you know, interesting things, whether it's, you know, David Copperfield's magic tricks and all the secrets of how they work, or, you know, the history of UFOs and forbidden archaeology, or, you know, uh, spiritual texts from all the major traditions. So, you know, whatever it is, we have these different vaults. And so, you know, the kind of the main, main collections and then special collections. There can also be 
you know, collections from particular groups or foundations or organizations that wanted to preserve something. Um, you know, on our upcoming missions, we have a lot of art and other things going. Um, so there'll be some interesting stuff, future missions. So that's the architecture. Um, and that's in metal. We can do it also with quartz, but quartz right now we can't do the analog part. You know, I'll do the digital part. Um, in nickel, we can do analog and digital. The third technology that we're using is DNA. Um, and that's because there have been recent advances in using DNA molecules as a medium for storing data and even for computing. Uh, and it kind of makes sense. Um, you know, in a way, DNA is a sort of data standard for biological systems on this planet. It's, it's a natural data standard that exists. Uh, it's reasonable to assume that if life continues on Earth, it will still be DNA-based, and if it becomes intelligent, it will eventually be able to read and understand DNA. So it makes sense to put knowledge in DNA because it, it's a lot easier than hoping that they're going to reinvent you know, Microsoft Windows, right? Um, DNA is, is something that they're very likely to figure out versus, you know, coming up with reinventing or re reverse engineering one of our operating systems. It, it really makes sense because it's essentially the first naturally occurring code in our, in it's our observable and data. And it's also a standard, right? It's cross platform. It's standard. Um, and so, um, it is now possible to use the language of DNA, um, to store data and recover it and even to compute on that data. Now, we're not talking about taking the DNA of an existing organism and using that DNA, although that is something we're curious about and if it's possible, but there really isn't that much available storage space in the DNA of a, of a living organism. Or at least let's say we don't know what the quote non-coding regions are for yet, like the so-called junk DNA. It's, it's increasingly turning out like it might not be junk, um, but we don't know how well it's preserved over generations either. So if you, if you stored information in the non-coding region of human DNA, for example, over many generations, it probably would not be preserved because as far as we can tell, the part of the DNA that is error corrected is the coding part. The non-coding part seems to mutate and doesn't seem to uh, be error corrected. So currently storing knowledge in, in the DNA of a living species um, doesn't seem to be very feasible unless you can find a way to make it error correcting by tying it to some something in the genome that is that has an important selective advantage, like immunity to cancer, for example. Maybe you could attach the knowledge to something like that such that it would not get filtered out because things would die if they didn't have it. But otherwise, um, it's hard to preserve knowledge in, in that form. Now, on the other hand, synthetic DNA, which isn't, isn't representing some living thing, but it's just molecules specifically assembled to store data, um, it, is very, it is a very high density way to store knowledge. Um, and you can massively replicate it for redundancy very cheaply. Right? Once you actually encode it, replication is very cheap. You can make a billion copies. Using RNA? Yeah, well, there's lots of ways to do it, but um, <laughs> using DNA replication technology, you can do it. Should we pause because of the talk? It's all good. We're all, we're, all, we're all living at home. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, we can uh, replicate it for massive redundancy. So you can, let's say, we, for example, we coded the Wikipedia into DNA, uh, and then we made a billion copies of it. And you know that entire data set of a billion copies of the Wikipedia is like smaller than a drop of water. It's tiny. Right. Oops. Like okay, so the entirety of Wikipedia in a DNA set is smaller than the drop of water. Is yeah. So we coded it into a bunch of DNA molecules. That, that represent the data set. Then we, then we replicated those molecules billions of times, right? And all of that is like a little soup, which is like smaller than a drop of water. And you've done this? Yes. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and uh, you're, are these, are these, I saw something about glass beads. Can you explain? Well, we can stick it into glass beads or other things. I mean, the, the question is then, what do you encapsulate that DNA in to preserve it? So DNA is uh, fairly stable, um, but it it is it does have risks, you know, heat, uh, moisture, extreme cold temperatures, or radiation. They can damage DNA or affect it. So you want to encapsulate it to protect it from the elements as much as you can. 
Um, that's why DNA in amber has survived. So if you think about that, you know, artificial amber, we've used different things, whether it's epoxy, which is pretty good, um, but you can also use glass beads or polymers. And there's different ways that you can encapsulate. You can even encapsulate the DNA just into paper, right? Mm. Just by dripping it onto the paper and letting it dry. So theoretically, so we've done this. you could give me a glass bead that has the entirety of the knowledge of Wikipedia encased inside of it. Yes, we could do that. Um, or we could, you know, that's something I would piece, buy, by the way. Yeah, we can be, <laughs> if you want a piece of jewelry that has it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Nice. So there's that is possible today, and we have done that. Um, and in fact, you know, we have even, you know, sent that kind of DNA of the Wikipedia into space. But uh, you know, it's unclear if the radiation in space will eventually damage the DNA. But if it's well encapsulated and protected from radiation, like inside of metal, it should be okay. Um, now, that's a way of encoding knowledge that's easier to recover than let's say encoding it as a DVD master because to to and to decode a DVD master first of all you have to know how the DVD physically works then you also have to understand the codec then you also have to have the software to get it and you know interpret it and decompress it and do whatever needs to be done then you have to have the operating system which requires the computer which requires you know the entire industry that made the computer right so Getting data off of a DVD is very hard, but getting, because there's many, many different transcodings that have to happen versus the um, the case with, with DNA where it'd be very direct from DNA to whatever system they have. Right. Um, so that's actually great. It's, it's, it's a good way to store digital data for this purpose. Um, on the other hand, um, that that is only one class of data. Now, one thing that we have done that's kind of meta is well, we took DNA data from other genomes and we just stored it in synthetic DNA as a data set. Is right? that the bio that's archive? One to, that's one way to do it, yeah. Um, or alternatively, you can actually just store the DNA itself. So one of one of the spinoff companies of the ARC mission, which is a partner of ours, is called LifeShip. And they are actually just preserving actual DNA. So you can send your DNA to go on LifeShip missions, but they're also putting plants and other species like a Noah's Ark. So that's actual DNA of living things. Um, so we can do both. So we can store actual DNA, we can store synthetic DNA of which, which contains data sets, and then we can store digital data in two different ways, well, three different ways, DNA, quartz, or nickel, and then analog data, currently the only good way to do that is nickel. Mm. It's we, we just recently spoke to the Svalbard Seed Bank, and it's so cool, but it's yeah. so, uh, it's so uh, kind of, it's so analog compared to what uh, you know you're describing here. Well, I mean, it's good though because you can take those seeds and actually plant. Them. You can actually use them, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting uh, concept. It's I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to find a way to to do that, but it's just you know, seeds are pretty. They're 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 large and they require a lot of temperature control, relatively large, and they require a lot of temperature control and so forth. So you have to build a seed vault, kind of like what they've done. Yeah. And and you have to hope that you know things won't warm up and that the thing won't be destroyed. You know. It would be just our luck if, you know, the comet eventually hits and it lands right on Svalbard. Um, yep. That would yeah. suck. <laughs> Hopefully that would suck. That would suck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we need redundant copies of these, these seed vaults. That'd be good. Let's, let's talk really quickly, uh, just because it's a curiosity. I'm sure you've been asked many times, what is the criteria for selecting the knowledge that's going on these backups? You know, how do you keep, how do you collect the, the will of, of 8 billion people or, mm. you know, the interests well, of 8 I mean, people? Yeah, it's a tough question. If you have very limited space, you have to make a lot of difficult curation decisions. Fortunately, we have a lot of space um, and it's increasing, right? The, the ability uh, to store big data and small things, it just gets better and better. So increasingly, our curation challenges, you know, are less of a problem. Um, so our strategy is let's send, let's try to send everything and not even make curation decisions uh, if we can help it. So. The first step is to curate the curators. So rather than us deciding what's important, take big, well-curated data sets that already exist and just take those. Wikipedia is an example. You know, millions of people have contributed. It may or may not be 100% accurate, but it is widely representative of at least what's out there, for better or for worse. It's an example. There are other data sets. I mean, there's Project Gutenberg, which has books, albeit 50 years old, but they are a good set of books um, you know, that aren't copyrighted. Uh, in fact, you can send copyrighted material too, because 
we're not really violating any anybody's copyright if nobody's recovering it, you know, and it certainly will be more than 50 years before anybody recovers this data. So it's not really a copyright issue um, because it's not being reproduced anywhere. It's not being recovered by anybody. It'll be more than 50 years before anybody sees it. So you could do that too. And, and, and people also under fair use are sending their own material books that they bought, things they have under fair use to send. Um, so uh, any, any of that material can also go. Uh, so there's a pretty big selection out there of what you can send. And rather than make a lot of difficult, you know, we only have one megabyte left. Should it be, you know, you know, Darwin or Einstein? We don't have that problem. Right. We, we have room for all of that. So, so far, um, we have, we have been able to store all categories of knowledge. Not every, not everything written, but, but certainly a large amount of important information and important works. Uh, just because I'm a huge music fan and a musician, how does music figure into this? Is it possible? You know, I, I could see yeah. in the courts potentially happening, but can you transfer the music to music can to be stored digitally or in it? Music can be stored digitally or as analog. Um, so the digital storage, whether it's DVD or essentially the next generation in courts, standard digital storage, you can do it also digitally in DNA, right? Um, you can store your music in an analog form, you know, using grooves in a record, like the Golden Record did, uh, or um, as analog images of waveforms, or as analog images of hexadecimal data, which is also relatively easy to convert back to waveforms. Mm. Well, all of those work, and and all of those are things that we do. Was there one album that you were like, all right, I don't care what anyone says, I'm getting this one <laughs> on on the moon? Well, we really haven't done a lot of music yet. Uh, we we have done a little bit, but most of that is still in upcoming missions. So I, there's not a lot I can really say about that right now. Um, but you know more about more about that later. Uh, we are partnered with some big labels that you know have large numbers of artists. Mm. So once again, you know we're not really making you know specific curation decisions. Although I will say that Miles Davis will be going. Glad to hear it. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and you mentioned the Voyager mission. Is that a big inspiration to you? Uh, how? You know. I mean, of course it is because they they really did it first and they showed the way. Um, you know, and they they explored a lot of the the space of possible questions and problems and issues and politics around some of this stuff. I mean, as you may you may know the funny story about how Paul, they you know the picture of the man and the woman next to each other naked politicians required that all the female genitalia was removed. So you got a man with genitalia, right? But you have this woman sort of neutered. So, you know, if somebody were to find this, they would conclude we're an asexual species. Right? Yeah. So that's kind of not the point, right? Of backing up knowledge. And it just goes to show you what can happen if you let politicians get into it. It's such a ridiculous notion. Um, so, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. so let's talk about what's out there. Uh, we have the you know, you mentioned the, the Lunar Library. I also know about the Leo Library, which I'm really interested in learning about what a blockchain node network in low Earth orbit look means. Um, what's 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 happening out in space? Well, we did a project with Space Chain where they on a CubeSat put a blockchain node, and we sent knowledge along with that, some Wikipedia with that. Um, so basically, um, there are there are various experiments going on, um, and I think commercial ready stuff taking place now as well, um, where, you know, using blockchain technology, you can essentially, um, syndicate the blockchain across a bunch of satellites, just like you do across a bunch of internet nodes on Earth. same idea. Um, there's also the notion of key generation where you get your entropy from outer space, um, which is, you know, this randomness that would be very hard to reproduce. Um, so when you generate a, a private key, you want to get entropy, you want to get random bits to seed the key. Um, and so, you know, sometimes they move your cursor around on your screen or you know, things you can do to get your randomness. Mm. You can also just get it from cosmic rays or background noise in space. And it'd be very hard for somebody to guess and reproduce what that was. This is kind of like a, an encryption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh, okay. for encryption key generation using random data measured in space that, uh, you know, conceivably is more random than something somebody gets on Earth. Still, you know, randomness is still pretty good. Pseudo randomness on Earth is still pretty good. But have been some random key generator experiments. There have been, you know, blockchain syndication experiments. The notion is actually that 
blockchain ledger technology uh, is actually really, really uh, well suited to space applications where uh, let's say you want to make a solar system wide network just for data, you know, uh, let alone financial information, just data. Right? The problem when the problem at solar system scale is that you have situations where one of your nodes is orbiting a planet and it goes behind the planet. You can't see it anymore, right? Or the planet moves mm -hmm. behind us, the sun and you can't see it anymore. So things are kind of appearing and disappearing around the network for periods of time because planets and suns get in the way, right? So what happens is you need an asynchronous updating network where things, when they reconnect, can figure out what they're missing or what they have it and basically sync in both directions. And that's what the blockchain does. So if you have a bunch a block, a bunch of blockchain nodes around the solar system are a good way to cache, store, forward, and update and synchronize data sets around the solar system when things are appearing and disappearing, and to make sure that ultimately the whole thing is in sync. So now, this, is, this is a different system than quartz or, or nickel. This isn't a computerized Yeah, system. that would be a purely computerized system. Yeah. Um, you couldn't really use quartz or nickel for that right now because those are, those are not really read-write technologies today. You know, they're, they're right once, read many times. Um, for blockchain, you'd, you'd have to continuously be updating the data. Right? Mm -hmm. So. And then we have a moon lander. Uh, and that happened uh, back in 2019. Is that correct? Yeah. So with Bereshit, uh, we had a rather hard landing on the moon. Um, the Israeli mission took the lunar library, um, but it crashed at the last minute. Um, due to a guidance system failure. And the impact was pretty intense. So um, it's questionable whether or not the, the library is there. We don't know. Um, we did a bunch of calculations, big science team, to try to determine if it could have survived the crash. And the answer is yes, it could have survived because it's just a piece of metal, basically. Um, it's not, the, the, the crash didn't generate heat that was strong enough to melt or vaporize the nickel. Um, it did generate forces that could have pulverized it, torn it apart. Um, but the nickel was also, uh, protected inside of a kind of a container that was built around it. Um, it was on the outside of the very end per free part of the spacecraft and it's flexible. And we know that things like that, uh, in other kinds of crash scenarios, whether it's airplane crashes and so forth, or the spacecraft crashes, those typically survive the crashes because the flexible things that aren't really firmly attached, it was actually, the, the, the library is actually taped, kept on tape to the inside the lander. So could have just been thrown downfield. Uh, and so there is a chance, I'd say a better than 50% chance that it's actually intact somewhere on the surface of the moon within, let's say 20 or 30 kilometers of the crash site. Mm -hmm. uh, but it'll be very hard to find um, since it's the size of a DVD, oh, wow. you know, in an area the size of North America. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it, did you learn a lot from that? Or are you going to give it another shot? Oh yeah. So we, of course, in our mid, our whole strategy is redundant backups in many places, not only off world, but also on the planet. Um, but cer certainly in terms of off world, as many as we can send to as many locations. So yes, we have two more missions uh, upcoming this year. Um, and those will land new versions, version two and version three in the library. Um, so those are already scheduled and going. And then we have additional missions later in, the, you know, later coming years to space, as well as um, plans to put copies on Earth. Um, so, for example, in deep underground storage locations. I was going to say the Earth's crust seems like a pretty safe place. Well, uh, I mean, there is a fair amount of convection that takes place over long time scales. I mean, literally nothing that's on the surface will be on the surface in a couple of million years. <laughs> it, right. It, it, it turns. Um, Something Science we should be thankful for. Uh, yeah, it helps the existence possibly. of life, but that's yeah. true. We're getting rid of forever chemicals and stuff like that. But um, there are some deep cave systems that seem to survive pretty long time, millions of years old. And so, it depends where you're talking about on the surface of the planet. Some places are better than others for this. Um, but there are there are some good locations where you can reliably store stuff for millions of years. And also, it's good because uh, they're easier to recover than going to Mars. Um, but probably, you know, other than deep caves um, or maybe mountain caves, the best storage locations are probably going to be um, Lagrange points uh, around various planets or modes around the sun. Various 
points that are orbitably stable um, are going to be good point, good places to store stuff uh, because you can find it with a telescope, perhaps if it's big enough or it has some kind of a beacon. Um, you can recover it with without having to land on another planet and then get off that planet. Mm -hmm. Of course, you would need to get off of this planet if this is where you're coming from. So there is that challenge. So you know the best places right here on Earth, if we're look, if we're storing stuff for future Earth inhabitants, um, the second best is Lagrange points. Interesting. Now, what does what was this techno? And uh, you've answered this. Um, but what scenarios is this technology built for? You know, are is there is there a part of you that hopes and that the libraries will never be needed, or is this? Really, we're thinking hundreds of thousands of years in the future. Uh, we're, we're creating the infrastructure, the technology, the network across our solar system to be able to spread out into this into this space. I think over time we'll have a you know optical communications network across the solar system that will be using laser-based communication, quantum uh, codes, um, and you know that will be a very good way to send information around the solar system. It'll still be limited by the speed of light. That's not bad. So there'll be a delay of you know fifteen or twenty minutes, um, but that's not bad. Um, it'll still have the the issue of when things are occluded by a planet or the sun, but it'll be able to pass messages around those obstacles just like the internet does. Uh, so I think we will have a, a solar system wide internet that'll be laser based, um, and that will probably have that. You know, we'll probably have that within fifty years. Um, I mean, we're already testing bits and pieces of that in space now. Um, in terms of the ARC mission, when that occurs, we'll, of course, be able to use that medium to send data to different nodes. But ultimately, when it gets to a node, we're going to want to write permanent archival copy, um, which will also be possible because the devices for writing these physical archival copies can be moved to those locations too. Um, but you know, I, I believe that multiple digital copies is not good enough. Uh, because digital information is inherently fragile. Um, the networks, the computers, um, the storage media are very fragile, speaking. And um, yes, if we store a permanent archival digital copy, that's okay. But if it's existing in, in some kind of ephemeral media, you know, whether it's magnetic, you know, or even some kind of a plastic flash ROM or whatnot, uh, those just are not very durable. They don't last that long. None of the storage media that we use today for digital technology will last longer than 10 to 15, maybe 20 years at most. It's incredible. It seems so short-sighted when you think of, when you put it that way. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy, actually. We were at the Library of Congress um, briefing them and a couple of years ago. There was a, there's been a big push in, in the U.S. and in governments around the world to go digital. And they're kind of infatuated with digital technology. So... They stopped making any new microfiche. A microfilm isn't very high density in terms of how much you can store per unit in space, but in the last about 50 years, it does require HVAC and temperature control. It's expensive to maintain, but you know it's your it's your copy of record in case anything goes wrong with your digital system. Well, now they're not doing that anymore. They're just doing everything digitally. And their idea is, well, we'll just put it in multiple locations while we're done in digital copies should be fine, except when would you really ever need your backup copy, right? You would need it only in the case of a catastrophic event, right? Such as a solar flare, a nuclear war, an EMP, you know, gray goo, something that wipes out everything, right? So no, redundant digital locations aren't good enough because you're, you're, you're actually storing these backups for the one situation where digital copies on multiple digital locations are useless, hmm. right? And they aren't thinking it through. They're like, well... You know, it's great because we have these multiple digital copies, but why are you making these guys? Right. Right. And at that point, having the declaration of independence on a piece of paper is actually more useful than, than having a paper is. Right. Yeah. Paper is actually done pretty well. At least some paper it depends where it was. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So, you know, it's a lot of our critical information today is being moved off of archival storage and into these completely ephemeral forms of storage that. Really, uh, really, if you think clearly about this, or don't last. And in fact, you know, when you when you look at it, our civilization with all of its advances and you know how great we are at science and so forth, is actually more ephemeral than any civilization that we've ever known of in history. Uh, it's the most ephemeral 
at-risk civilization that's ever existed that we know of. It's, yeah, it just could all be deleted in a second. It's so insane. <laughs> Something, if the power went out, you know, within 10 to 20 years, there would be nothing left of any knowledge or information except what was in paper, metal, or stone, or DNA. Um, the paper wouldn't last very long because of mold and, and other issues, unless it was sealed in some kind of very protected environment. Um, and then you'd just be, you know, all the plastic would be gone within 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, you'd just be left with, you know, whatever was stored in metal or stone, you know, and, and, and DNA. So what's holding, what's holding you up right now? What's, what does the arch mission need to, or arc mission need to succeed? What is, cause that's well, I mean, like. the main, the main thing is really funding because, you know, these missions are not free, you know, we're nonprofit, um, but we, you know, we do this based on donations private donations and you know we've had support from lots of different people um but we need major support to really execute this at, at the scale it needs to be executed i mean you really want to make a massive ongoing redundant backup of the planet of every con country every civilization um you know you need to be sending dozens of these a year you know not one or two a year and you need to be putting them into every continent so you know if you run the numbers on that you need funding on the order of, you know, 10 million bucks, 20 million bucks a year to do it really well. That would be, that would be enough to do it really well. So we're not quite there. And, uh, I've seen some programs for there where people can sponsor their name to be put into an archive or something. Yeah. Like some of our partners have done things to support us. One company is called GLL, Galactic Legacy Labs, um, and other nonprofit and for-profit things have, have, have arisen to support us and to try to help get us donations by doing commercial things where they'll, you know, people can be included because typically an individual can't participate in the ARC mission. Um, if you want to do that, you have to come through a partner. You know, we're taking curated collections. So if a partner curates a collection, um, then that can be done. Um, you know, we have to pay for our payload space and we have to pay to make these discs. We have to pay to get them launched. So, you know, partners pay, um, for those costs. They, su they subsidize those costs. Um, so, and that's one way that we can cover our thoughts mm -hmm. for people to participate. Now, just because I know that you are uh, interested in these things, I have to kind of delve for a second into consciousness, intelligence, knowledge, even yeah. quantum effects. Uh, you know, big part of my conversation with Lewis was that his book and that these these sort of ideas, we're trying to create a civilizational seed. We're, we're trying to cause civilizational emergence. And... A big question that I've had, you know, uh, we all know it to be true, but why is the existence of consciousness, of knowledge, of intelligence, why is that important? What is the scientific, the philosophical, the spiritual argument in favor of the existence of consciousness? What do you think about when you when you have those conversations with yourself? Well, um, I mean, first of all, I think that consciousness is probably not as unique to humans as we might think. Uh, I think it's, I think consciousness is something fundamental about the very substrate of uh, the universe itself. Um, I think that it is, it is directly coming from the, the quantum field itself or from the quantum vacuum. Uh, if there wasn't an observer, at least according to quantum mechanics, nothing would be happening. Nothing could happen without an observer. So either each of us is creating the whole universe by observing it, or there's one solitary observer, maybe, you know, a sheep at the end of the universe observing everything, um, or, um, you know, God is the observer, or, uh, or there are many observers all over the universe. Mm -hmm. Or a quantum uh, field itself is the observer, is you know. capable of doing that, yeah. And so uh, we don't know yet. But what we do know is that uh, you can't have a wave function collapse if something doesn't break that um, superposition. And it seems that observation, which you know is often misinterpreted by New Age people as meaning just conscious observation, really observation on a quantum in a quantum sense is leakage of information from this isolated quantum system to another quantum system. Right? When information leaks out, that causes the superposition to then break and fall into one of the positions. Right. And so, um, the, but there is this philosophical interpretation as well, which is, well, that's all well and good, but ultimately where does that information leak to, you know, and in the end, if, if there is nobody to see that 
or hear the tree falling doesn't really make a sound, right? And so um, there is an interpretation of quantum mechanics, which which takes it all the way out to consciousness being, you know, like consciousness that we think of as consciousness, not just information leakage, but you know, an actual conscious observer knowing the result of the experiment. And they've even done, tried to do some tests to, to try to narrow down on what that really means. But uh, anyway, there's one argument, which is that consciousness is inherent because it's part of the process of quantum mechanics. There's a, There are different interpretations of what that means. Uh, there's another uh, argument, which is that consciousness you know, is important because there's something divine about it. It's not science, it's, it's religion. Um, and, you know, consciousness is directly from something divine or is something divine. That's a different way of looking at consciousness. And it might actually be equivalent in the end. It might all be the same. Uh, but is it important? Is what we're doing important for preserving, as Elon Musk would say, the light of consciousness and spreading it throughout the solar system? Well, I mean, yes, in the sense that wherever our conscious species goes, it's bringing this consciousness with it. Um, the consciousness is not something we're making. It's already there. Somehow it's in us. It's, it's there. Um, and we don't know, you know, to what extent, what role it really plays in intelligence, but it seems to be part of that process. Um, the knowledge and everything that we're transmitting includes a lot of knowledge about consciousness from the different religious traditions, spiritual traditions. Um, but you know, it, it, it's there principally for conscious recipients who would be sentient beings like us. I tend to not believe that machines are going to be conscious, um, like we are. Uh, and that that's because, um, basically if consciousness comes from the substrate, whatever that is, uh, if you were to build a simulation of an intelligent machine or intelligent organism, that simulation exists many layers away from the substrate itself. The the mechanics of its simulated brain and its simulated thoughts, you know, are many, many levels of transcoding, if you will, away from the actual substrate. You know, they're they're virtual machine upon virtual machine upon virtual machine. You know, eventually you're out you have this AI, but you know, to get from the AI down to the quantum field is many, many, many systems, right? Um, whereas with us, I think that our, conscious, our consciousness is the substrate. There's nothing between us and the substrate. That's a big, big difference between our consciousness and any form of synthetic or artificial consciousness. It's a really interesting thought that you're having here in that in order to simulate consciousness, you actually have to have the ability to simulate the entire universe. Probably, probably. Um, and even then, I'm not sure it would work um, because... The universe doesn't include the substrate. It, it it requires the substrate. So by definition, you know, if you have the universe, the substrate is outside the universe. Hmm. So interesting. So it it, it leads me back to like that. You know, I've been reading a lot about Grant the unified uh, the search for the unified theory of 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 everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, my thought was, oh, you know, until we figure this out, we will never figure out virtual consciousness or we would, you know, and, and, uh, what, what are your reactions to that in terms of the progression that we've made in, in understanding how, why everything exists? Um, well, I guess, um, grand unified theory, uh, is probably an impossible goal. For, many, for a bunch of reasons. First of all, Gödel showed that you can never really have a perfect theory. There's always going to be holes. There are either going to be things that are true that you can't prove, or there are going to be things that you can prove that are inconsistent with each other. So there will always be some holes in whatever theory we come up with, at least if it's a formal system um, that can map to mathematics. Um, now let's just put that aside. Um, we could we could get pretty close to a to a to a grand unified theory, but that grand unified theory should include and or account for consciousness. Right now, the grand unified theories which are being attempted 
are, are completely on the object side reality. They're just uh, looking at physical things, physical processes, materials. They are not including the subjective side uh, and any potential impact it might have. And so right now, it's very one-sided. It's looking only at the you know, sort of phenomenal side of the of reality, not the noumenal part, which seems to be just as real, if not more real, for most of us. Uh, and so I think that reality is probably a lot more like virtual reality than we think, um, in that there's kind of a program, if you will. It's it's code. What's what's emerging is coming from code. Now, code in this case isn't lines of code like we think about it, but more like the Wolfram sense of graphs, are abstract graphs of, uh, that are interacting. Um, but it's mathematical and it's essentially computational. So I think the universe is like a computer, um, very different in structure than what we think of today as a computer, but nonetheless, it's computing um, using kind of graphs, it's computing with graphs. Um, and for a good ex for a good example of this, you, you can look at what Stephen Wolfram is doing these days with his Wolfram physics project, which illustrates it very well. Now, I think that probably shows a lot about what's going on on the mechanical level. Um, it doesn't yet explain much about where consciousness fits in and the role consciousness plays, although he's he's exploring a little bit about superposition and some of that. He's getting there. Um, but I think um, consciousness is still a big anomaly, and I think that um, ultimately, I think that the universe is coming from consciousness, not consciousness coming from the universe. And um, therefore, consciousness is fundamental like space and time. Well, you've got to have to have space and time before you can have a universe. I know people sometimes say, oh, space and time is in the universe or comes with the universe, but then from what? So, I mean, it's sort of a cheap answer. You can say spell space and time, you know, are inside the universe. And when the universe came into being, if that ever happened, then space and time came with it. But in fact, that sort of just begs the question, well, there was something before that, and that you could, you have to call it something, you can call it pre-space and pre-time, but it still is some kind of a, a, a region or something that space and time came from. Well, um, we haven't gotten there, but I think that is consciousness. Wow. I know uh, I am just in, in love with this conversation and I could do it for hours. I want to be conscious of your time. Um, and maybe this is a conversation that can be continued at the end of the magical uh, exploration of magical, uh, mm -hmm. uh, your, your, your other big, big project that I want to talk about. But I just have to say thank you so much genuinely for your time. I know how busy you are and everything you're doing and getting to contribute your, your knowledge to little uh, podcasters and creators like me is just uh, a huge well I've known you for a long time <laughs> I know I feel I feel that way um, I have one last question who else should I be talking to should I be uh, pursuing in disruptors in this space in your space or people who really inspire you and who would you want to sit down with to work on these kinds of issues Stephen Wolfram would be probably the first person he's the smartest person I know I mean he's he is the most important living genius on this planet um, for science and math. And he's not, he's, he isn't recognized the way he should be because most people just don't understand what he's doing. Um, and he's so smart that he doesn't really have time to feed people's egos. Um, you know, he's, he's, he just, he's like a machine. And, um, you know, I think a lot of academics are very competitive and they rough them the wrong way. Uh, but the truth is he, he is doing incredibly original, important work that nobody understands today just like they didn't understand Copernicus and Galileo. Um, but in 50 to 100 to 200 years, what he's done today is going to be, you know, considered to be some of the most important work that was done during the, this whole, you know, several centuries of time. Um, it's really, really, really important, interesting, and, and original. So he, he is who I would recommend from a, for science. The science. I would uh, uh, do anything to talk to Stephen Wolf. Well, I can <laughs> make that happen. He's awesome. Let's so talk after. Years. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would, that's who I would talk to. And by the way, he's he's he, he's very uh, you know he and I debate. I mean, he's he likes what I'm doing because he thinks it's fun, 
but I think he's pretty skeptical that anybody could ever recover it. Now, I disagree. I think we've solved that problem. Um, but, you know, it's a fun debate. Uh, let's have that debate after we have... And his on. information is on our... Archives, by the way. We'll bring you together and, and to get that debate going. That's awesome. Um, well, Nova, thank you again. Incredible work. Please keep it up. Keep us posted. Um, we got to have these all over the solar system one way or another just for the awesomeness and awe-inspiring nature. Uh, just so that people in the future can find these things and be like, wow, who did that? These, <laughs> they are the progenitors, the progenitor race, whoever they were, placed these these archives around the solar system for us to find. My, my hope is that they listen to Miles Davis and be like, damn, this is some good That's shit. Cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. That'd be awesome. Well, Noah, thank yep. you. Um, thank you. And uh, have a great day. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>